All praises to the most high. So tonight's topic is called have salt in yourselves. Have salt in yourselves. Let's open up with the book of Luke. Okay, Luke chapter 9. Luke 9 verse 62. Let's start at verse 61. Luke 9. Okay, Luke chapter 9 and verse 61. Let's start there. You know Luke, what? Let's get to the point. Read, get to the point. 62. Read what you got. Luke 9, verse 62. Come on. The book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 62. Go ahead. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Read it again. Read it again. Luke, chapter 9, verse 62. Come on. And Jesus said unto him, Mm -hmm. No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. It says, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Remember now, the most High God, he called us into this truth. You understand? It says, now that he called you into this truth, it says, guess what? Don't put your hand to the plow because you are called to come into this truth and you look back. You understand? The law says you're not fit for the kingdom. You understand? Because you are double-minded. You are not really here. Okay? You are not really here with us. That's what the Lord is saying right there. Read again. Verse 62. Luke chapter 9 verse 62. Read. And Jesus said unto him, mm. No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking black, is fit for the kingdom of God. No man, having put his, his hand to the plow. The plow is the what? The vineyard, working in the vineyard. You understand? Bringing in, ushering in the kingdom of heaven on earth. Watch this. Give me that in Sirach. Okay, give me the book of Ecclesiasticus. Give me Ecclesiasticus chapter 8. No, Sirach chapter 18. Okay, Ecclesiasticus chapter 18 verse 7. Read that. Ecclesiasticus chapter 18 verse 7. Mm -hmm. When a man hath done when a man has done, when a man has done, now you he says you have done, meaning what you came into this truth, you are doing the work. Okay, come on. Then he beginneth. Then he beginneth to what? Watch this, keep on, come on. And when he leaveth off, you see what you see what you begin to do? You begin to leave off. He says, When a man has done, you come into this truth, you do the work of the most high God as you are commanded. You put your hand to the plow. Then it says he began to do what to leave it off. You understand? You are looking back. Go ahead. And when he leave it off, mm -hmm. then he shall be doubtful. Now you are no longer in the spirit anymore. You understand? You are double-minded. Now you are questioning things. You are doubting yourself. What is the doubt? Because remember, give me that in 2 Peter 1. Okay? I believe it's 2 Peter. It's not in my notes. But it just popped into my head. 2 Peter 1. Okay, Second Peter chapter one and verse. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, Second Peter. I mean, sec, I mean, First Peter. Second Peter one. Okay, Second Peter one verse twenty one. Watch this. Not verse twenty one. Verse nineteen. Read verse nineteen. Second Peter chapter one verse nineteen. Mm -hmm. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. A what? A more sure word of prophecy. You see that part right there? A more sure, sure word of prophecy. Meaning there's no, there's not supposed to be any doubt in your mind about this is the real truth of the scriptures. You understand? This is the gospel of Christ. You're not supposed to have any doubt in your mind. When you first coming in here, I get that. But those of brothers that have been here for a little bit, guess what? There shouldn't be any doubt in your mind. You understand? Read that part again. We have a what? We have also a more sure word of prophecy. We also have a more sure word of prophecy. That more sure word of prophecy is Jesus the Christ. He is the more sure word of prophecy. You understand? Go back to where was that now? Ecclesiastes chapter 18 verse 7. Read. When a man hath done, mm -hmm. then he beginneth. And when he leaveth off, then he shall be doubtful. Then he shall be doubtful. You understand? You begin to leave off. You've done the work. You are doing the work. 
And then you begin to live off because doubt has entered into your mind. Because now Christ is, not, that is no longer that sure word of prophecy no more. You understand? He's no longer that more sure word of prophecy. Now watch this. Um, go back, go back to Luke 9, okay? Luke chapter 9. Luke 9, verse 62 again. Luke chapter 9, verse 62. Read. And Jesus said unto him, No man having it, having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. You see what he's saying? And looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now watch this. Give me that in Revelation 3. Okay, Revelation 3, 15. Let's read that. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. Mm -hmm. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Right? I would that thou wert cold or hot. You see what Christ is, says? I wish you were cold or hot, meaning what? Either you make a decision. That's what he's saying. He says, make a decision. We, so Christ is saying, he knows our works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wet. I, I, he says, I would thou wet cold or hot. So Christ is saying, I wish you would make a decision. Because as a people, we can be double-minded as a people. Watch this, hold this. Give me that in First Kings, okay? Chapter 18. Might be verse 20 or 23. Let me look at it. First Kings chapter 18. Because Elijah was talking about this thing. First Kings chapter 18. Hold on a second. Hey, brother Bezalel, I need my Bible back. Okay. First Kings Mr. chapter Lundra. 18. Um, yes, read it. First Kings chapter 18, verse 21. Go ahead. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, mm -hmm. How long hold ye between two opinions? You see what he's asking? He says, How long? He says, How long hold ye between two opinions? How long are you gonna be stuck in the middle? That's what he's asking. Because that's what Israel was doing. You understand? They were they were what they were stuck between two opinions. And the operative word is opinions. Give me that in Sirach, okay? Give me that in Sirach, chapter 3, verse 24. Read that. Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 24. Mm -hmm. For many are deceived by their own vain opinion. You see that part right there? Because Israel was stuck between two opinions. They were not, they, it was not, it had nothing to do with the most like God's laws. No, it was based upon what? their own vain opinion. They were deceived by it and they were, they were stuck. Which evil decision do I make? But either way, they were, they were going to make an evil decision either way. It was not about the laws of the Most High. No. Read that again, verse 24. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 24. Come on. For many are deceived by their own vain opinion. They are deceived by their own vain opinion. Go ahead. And an evil suspicion hath overthrown their judgment. You see that thing? An evil suspicion have overthrown their judgment. What is the evil suspicion? Yeah, I want to talk about the feast just for a second. I'm going to talk about it later on. The things that I've been seeing since we started with the preparations of the feast, both men and women, by the way. It says, and an evil suspicion have overthrown their judgment. I'm going to deal with that evil suspicion later on. And the things that I'm seeing as a result of an evil suspicion. Go back to First Kings chapter 18, verse 21. Watch this. Mm -hmm. Come on. First Kings chapter 8, verse 21. Go ahead. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long hold ye between two opinions? How long hold ye between two opinions? How long are you going to be deceived by your own vain opinion and because of your evil suspicion? That's what he's asking them. You understand? Because they don't believe what is written. That's why they are double-minded. They put their hand to the plow, but they are still looking back into when the world. Like you understand, spiritually, they are Lord's wife. Watch this. Hold this. Give me that in wisdom of Solomon. Okay. Wisdom of Solomon, real quick. Let me see. Mm. Don't be spiritually Lord's wife. Okay. Don't be Lord's wife. Watch this. Give me the book. I know it's in wisdom of Solomon. It's been a while. Yes, ten. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 10, verse 6. 
Read that. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 10, verse 6. Mm -hmm. When the ungodly perished, when they're what? She delivered the righteous. When the ungodly perished. When the ungodly perished, the ungodly perished. Go ahead, watch this. She delivered the righteous man. She delivered the, she is wisdom. Wisdom delivered the righteous man. Wisdom will always deliver a righteous man. Go ahead. She delivered the righteous man who mm -hmm. fled from the fire which fell down upon, upon the five cities. So the righteous man is our forefather, Lord. He was a righteous man. You understand? He says he fled from the fire which fell, which fell down upon the five cities. This is going into Sodom and Gomorrah. When the Lord was destroying Sodom and Gomorrah with fire from heaven. Go ahead. Of whose wickedness, even to this day, the wasteland that smoketh is a testimony. Is a what? Is a testimony. Meaning it's still standing today. Historically, we can still find it on the map, on the earth, where, Lord, where, where Sodom and Gomorrah was, and the, the ashes of Sodom and Gomorrah. They are still there, the Lord is teaching us. Read. And plants bearing fruit that never come to ripeness. You see that thing? And plants bearing fruit that never came to ripeness. This goes into also what? Men. Go ahead. And a standing pillar of salt mm -hmm. is a monument of an unbelieving soul. Read that part again. And a what? And a standing pillar of salt is a monument of an unbelieving soul. You see what the Bible is saying? The standing pillar of salt is Lord's wife because she was turned into salt and she became a pillar as a memorial. He says, is a monument of an unbelieving soul because Lord's wife, she did not believe. She was double-minded. That's why when judgment came, the husband and the kids was delivered. She was put to death. You see that thing? Go back to where was that now, okay? First Kings chapter eight, verse 21. Read. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long holds he between two opinions? Read. If the Lord be God, follow him. Mm. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Why, would, why do you think the people didn't say nothing? Because look what it says. It says, if the Lord be God, then follow him. So the reason why they halted between these two opinions, it was because of what? They did not believe the Lord. Because if that was the case, there was this, this conversation was not going to go down. The Lord was not going to put the spirit on Elijah for him to ask these questions. But because they had to make a decision to decide, mm, which one do I go with? It means they did not believe the Lord one bit. You understand? They was double-minded. That's why this conversation is, that's why the Lord put this thing in the, in the book. Because guess what? The cases just keep reoccurring. The same spirit that was back then, those same spirits are back today. And guess what? They are still halting between two opinions. You understand? Because they have an evil suspicion. You understand? And guess what? Their judgment is overthrown. That's why now they cannot speak sense. That's why they kept quiet. Because they was confounded. Watch this. Give me that in Isaiah 28. Okay. Give me Isaiah real quick. Because... They were confounded. And the reason why they was confounded is because of this right here. Give me Isaiah 28 and verse, verse 16. Read that. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 16. Go ahead. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone. A what? A tried stone. For a foundation, a stone. A foundation, a stone. You understand? A more sure word of prophecy. That's what we're reading here. Go ahead. A tried stone. Mm -hmm. A precious cornerstone. Go ahead. A sure foundation. A what? A sure foundation. A sure foundation. Who is that? The Christ. The Black Messiah. Go ahead. He that believeth shall not make haste. You see that part right there? He that believeth shall not make haste. 
Meaning what? You are not going to be confounded. If you believe in this sure foundation, a precious cornerstone, you understand, a tri stone, you are not going to make haste. You are not going to be confounded. Watch this. Give me that in uh, Sirach 2. Okay. Ecclesiasticus. Give me Sirach chapter 2 and verse 1. Start of verse 2. You know what? Start of verse 2. Sirach 2 verse 2. Read that. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 2. Mm -hmm. Set thy heart aright and constantly endure. Go ahead. And make not haste in time of trouble. You see that part right there? Make not haste in time of trouble. Don't make haste because when you make haste, that means you don't believe that Christ is a sure foundation. You don't believe he's a, he's a precious cornerstone. You don't believe he's a tried stone. You understand? You don't believe it's the foundation of Zion. You don't believe that thing. That's why they were caught between two opinions. You understand? They were confounded. They were confused. Watch this. Read that part again. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 2. Mm -hmm. Set thy heart aright and constantly your, endure. Meaning get your mind right. You understand? Get your mind right. That's what he says. Set thine heart aright. Get your mind right. You understand? And constantly endure and make not haste in time of trouble. Now watch this. Jump down. You know, read verse 3. Then we're going to jump. Read verse 3. Verse 3. Mm -hmm. Cleave unto him and depart not away. You see what the Lord that is thou saying? Mayest... He says, cleave unto him. Cleave unto him. Cleave unto him. But as long as you are double-minded, you are not going to cleave unto the Lord. You will have doubts. Some of you, you are doubtful. Some of you have an evil suspicion. That's why your judgment is overthrown. You're always confused. That when the trial comes, you always fail the test. Read that again, verse, verse, uh, verse 3. Ecclesiastes 2, verse 3. Go ahead. Cleave unto him and depart not away, mm -hmm. that thou mayest be increased at thy last end. That thou may be increased at thy last end. Now read verse 10. Watch this. Verse 10. Mm -hmm. Look at the generations of old and see. Mm. Did ever any trust in the Lord and was confounded? You see that part right there? Did any did ever any trust in the Lord and was confounded? Meaning what? They did not make haste. That's what the confounded goes into. They did not make haste. They was not confounded. They was not confused. Why? Because they trusted in the Lord. So every time, any any time when you see a brother confused, a sister confused, it means they don't trust in the Lord. That's why they are confounded. So the Lord is teaching us, this, look at the generations of old and see, meaning examine your history. See how our forefathers and our foremothers, how they make decisions, how they put their trust in the Lord, and they were never confounded. But if you are confounded this day, it means you don't trust in the Lord. And because you don't trust in the Lord, that means you trust in something else or someone else. Read that again, verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 10. Go ahead. Look at the generations of old and see, mm -hmm. did ever any trust in the Lord and was confounded? Read. Or did any abide in his fear and was forsaken? Read. Or whom did he ever despise that called upon him? You see that part right there? Who is this? Or whom did he ever despise that called upon him? The problem is that our people, we don't call upon the Lord. We don't. We don't cry unto the Lord. We have that Christian spirit. Some of brothers and sisters too, you are still in that Christian mindset. You understand? No, God knows my heart. He knows what I want. I don't have to say it out loud. You're, why? Because you are still comfortable. Everything is still good. The Mosa has not invaded your life yet. That's why you are confounded. That's why you think you can, you can be one foot in and one foot out. One minute you trust in the Lord, so you think. And another time, you trust in the world, in, in the world, but 100% you trust in the, in the world, not in the Mosai. You understand? That's why you are confounded. You are confused. You're making haste. You understand? That's what the Lord is teaching us right there because you don't believe Christ is the full sure foundation. Go back to Isaiah 28, verse 16 again. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. 
Go ahead. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, mm. Behold, I lay in Zion a foundation, a stone. I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, Ray. a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Ray. He that believeth shall not make haste. He that believeth shall not make haste. You be believe, you believe on the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, meaning you keep his commandments. You're not going to make haste. You understand? You're not going to be confounded. Why? Because you know he is the Christ. He is the Christ. And guess what? Give me Matthew 7, 24. Watch this. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. I have not forgotten that I'm still on topic. Don't misunderstand. Okay, Matthew 7, verse 24. Watch this. Come on. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Read. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, mm -hmm. I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. You see that part right there? It says, is whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. Not only must you hear, but you must hear, then you must do. You see what he's telling us? It says that whoso, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. So once you hear it, you must do it. You must apply it. He says, I will liken him unto a wise man. Watch this. Give me Proverbs 1 and 5. I will liken him unto a wise man. Read that. Proverbs 1 verse 5. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 5. Go ahead. A wise man will hear. They will what? A wise man will hear. You see that thing? The key word says, a wise man. And what makes us wise? The laws of God, according to Psalms 19 verse 7. It says, a wise man will hear. You know I mean? That means you will open your ears to the laws of God. Your ear will be listening in, to that, in, in that frequency. You'll be vibrating in that frequency to hear the word of the Most High God. Go ahead. A wise man will what? A wise man will hear mm -hmm. and will increase learning. Stop right there. And will he will do what? And will increase learning. So you see that part right there? It says increase. Increase learning. So that means you are continually increasing in your learning. That means you are growing. There's spiritual growth going on in your spirit. That's why it says a wise man will hear and will increase learning. They're not going to decrease their learning. They are going to increase it. They're going to put more effort to know more, to apply more. You understand? To get more wisdom because they understand it's nation-building time. Go ahead. And will increase learning. Mm -hmm. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. A man of understanding because once you, once you hear, you will do like we read in Matthew 7, and you're going to increase your learning. Guess what? It says, and a man of understanding, that's when understanding comes. Because you will hear, you will increase learning, then the Lord will give you understanding of the things that you've learned. You see that part right there? It works hand in hand. So go back to where he was at now. Matthew 7, verse 24 again. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Come on. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and mm -hmm. doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which Wait. built his house upon a rock. Which built his house upon a rock. What's another name for rock? A stone. Another name for rock is a what? A stone. That's what this is. It says, which built his house upon a rock. Give me that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Okay. 1 Corinthians 10. The Apostle Paul is going to say the same thing that we just read in Isaiah. 1 Corinthians. I believe that's what I want. 1 Corinthians 10 and 1. You know what? Just go to the point. Read verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. Read. And did eat, and did all eat the same spiritual meat. Mm -hmm. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. Come on. And that rock was Christ. That rock was who? And that rock was Christ. That rock was Jesus the Christ. So go back to Matthew 7, verse 24. 
Matthew chapter 7 verse 24. Mm-hmm. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. That, for, that sure foundation, that tried stone, that chief cornerstone, that precious stone. Okay, come on, verse 25. Verse 25. And the rain descended. Stop right And the there. floods came. And the what? And the rain descended. The rain is talking about your trials. The trials will come upon you. You understand? The rain descended, goes into your trials. Read. And the floods came. The floods came. The floods goes into your the temptations. That's the floods. Read. And the winds blew. The winds goes into the doctrines. You understand? The winds blew. Go ahead. And beat upon that house. That house, remember, that house is who? You are the house. Okay? You are that spiritual house. Read. And it fell not. And it fell not. Why? Because you build it. Keep going. Let me not mess it up. For it was founded upon a rock. It was founded upon Christ. Christ is the foundation. So he says it was founded upon a rock. He's the rock. You understand? Read. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not mm -hmm. shall be likened unto a foolish man. You are a foolish which... man. Because, hold on. He says, if you, he says, everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, they hear, but they do not. You see that part right there? They hear them, but they don't do them. Is it shall be likened unto a foolish man. That's a fool right there. Go ahead. Which built his house upon, upon the sand. Which built his house upon sand. The world. Go ahead. And the rain descended. Mm -hmm. And the floods came. And rain? the winds blew. Come and on. beat upon that house. Mm. And it fell. He did what? And it fell. And it fell. The house fell because it was built upon sand. Read. And great was the fall of it. And great was the fall of it. Now, this is heavy. So when you are confounded, you're double-minded. It means by default, your house is built upon sand. By default. Whenever you are doubtful, you have an evil suspicion, you guess what? Your house is built upon sand. It's not built upon Christ. You understand? It's not built upon a, a sure foundation. That's why Elijah posed the question. Christ posed the same question. Go back to Revelation 3, verse 15 again. Revelation 3, verse 15. Go ahead. I know thy works, mm -hmm. that thou art neither cold nor hot. Read. Really? I would that thou art cold or hot. You see what he's saying? It says, make a decision. Don't be double-minded. The reason why there's double-mindedness is because that house is built upon sand. It's not a sure foundation. You understand? It's not built upon Christ, the rock that followed us in the wilderness. No, it's built upon sand, the world. You understand? Now watch this. Keep going. Read on. Verse 16. Mm -hmm. So then, because thou art lukewarm, mm -hmm. and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So Christ says, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Because guess what? It means, mm, this is some beautiful stuff right here. Oh, praises to the most high God. Read that again. Verse 16. Revelation chapter 3 verse 15. Go ahead. So then, because thou art lukewarm, Read. and neither cold nor hot, uh -huh. I will spew thee out of my mouth. This is going to be very important later on. Oh, praise to the Lord for that thing. Now watch this. Give me 2 Chronicles 13 verse 1. Mm. 2 Chronicles chapter 13 verse 1. Watch this. 2 Chronicles chapter 13 verse 1. Read. Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam began Abiah to reign over Judah. So now in the 18th year of Jeroboam, Abiah began to reign. Abiah was the son of Jeroboam. Jump up to the previous chapter, chapter 12, verse 16. Okay. Read that. 
Second Chronicles chapter 12, verse 16. Read. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers mm -hmm. and was buried in the city of David. Come on. And Abiah, his son, reigned in his stead. So Abiah was Rehoboam's son. Now chapter 13, verse 1. Second Chronicles, chapter 13, verse 1. Read. Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, began Abiah to reign over Judah. So now Abiah is taking the throne now. He's sitting on the throne after his father died. Go ahead. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Micaiah, the daughter of Uriel of Gibeah. Mm. And there was war between Abiah and Jeroboam. Now, now, this is the key right here. It says there was war between what? There was, they says there was war between Abiah and Jeroboam. So there was war. Now we need to find out who is the one that instigated this war. Okay, come on. And Abiah set the battle in array with an army of valiant men of war, mm -hmm. even 400,000 chosen men. Come on. Jeroboam also set the battle in array against him with 800,000 chosen men, being mighty men of valor. So when you look at this, you might think that Abiah is the one that instigated the war. No, that's not the case. Read verse 3 again. Second Chronicles chapter 13, verse 3. Read. And Abiah set the battle in array with an army of valiant men of war. Mm -hmm. Even 400,000 chosen men. Jeroboam also set the battle in array against him with 800,000 chosen men, being mighty men of valor. So now Abiah, he came with 400,000 chosen men. Chosen men. Not everybody is built for war. That's what the Lord is teaching us. That's why it says chosen men. Meaning not everybody is meant to go to the streets. You understand? Yes, we must all go to the streets, but guess what? There's other works in the body that needs to get done. You understand? That's why it says chosen men. And it doesn't mean if you do, you're not in the battlefield, but you're doing works in the body, it doesn't make you less. No, no. Every piece is important. Okay? But it says, Jeroboam also said battle in array against him with 800,000 chosen men. Okay? Keep going. Read verse 4 now. Read. Verse 4, and Abiah stood up upon Mount Zemarim, mm -hmm. which is in Mount Ephraim, and said, Hear me, thou Jeroboam, and all Israel. So now Abiah is addressing Jeroboam and all Israel, meaning the army that came to war with Abiah. Okay, come on. Or do you not you know, to know that the Lord read, read, God of I'm Israel... I'm sorry. Read, read verse 4 again. Read verse 4 again. Second Chronicles, chapter 13, verse 4. Read. And Abiah stood up upon Mount Zemarim, which is in Mount Ephraim, and said, Hear me, thou Jeroboam, and all Israel. So now he's addressing Northern Kingdom. Jump down to verse 6. Come on. Verse 6. Yet mm. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, is risen up. And has rebelled against his Lord. You see, that's the key right there. So who started this war? Jeroboam. Jeroboam started this war. Jump up to chapter 12, verse 15 now. Second Chronicles, chapter 12, verse 15. Mm -hmm. Now the acts of Rehoboam, first and last, are they not written in the book of Shemaiah the prophet? And of Edo, the seer concerning genealogies, and there were wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually. There was a war between Jeroboam and Rehoboam continually. You understand? Watch this. Now, chapter 13, verse 6, once again. Second Chronicles, chapter 13, verse 6. Ray. Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Mm -hmm. The servant of Solomon, the son of David, is risen up and has rebelled against his Lord. And has what? 
and has rebelled against his Lord. So Jeroboam, he rebelled against the Lord. Jeroboam rebelled against the Most High God. Keep going. We're going to find out how he did it. Read. And there are guarded unto him vain men. You see what happens when you, hold on. Belial. You see what happens when you rebel against the Lord? You see, it says, and they were gathered unto him vain men. Isn't the same thing that happened to Absalom? Absalom, he had 400 dumb Negroes following him. You see that thing? Because he was a wicked Negro. Okay, read, read that again, verse 7. Second Chronicles chapter 13, verse 7. Read. And there are gathered unto him vain men, mm. the children of Belial. The children of the devil. And have strengthened what, themselves. That's what they was called. Northern kingdom because they were doing evil as hell. Okay. I'm sorry, read that again. The children of Belial. Mm -hmm. Read. Second Chronicles chapter 13, verse 7. And there are gathered unto him vain men, the children of Belial, and have strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Mm. When Rehoboam was young and tender hearted, he could not withstand them. And could not withstand them. Who's the them? Northern kingdom. So now Jeroboam is the one that actually started a war against Southern kingdom. Because it says, and gathered unto him vain men, the children of Belial, the children of the devil, and have strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Now watch this. Read on, verse 8. And now ye think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hand of the sons of David, and ye be a great multitude. Mm. And there are with you golden calves, which Jeroboam made you for gods. So now watch this. Read verse 7 and 8 together. Second Chronicles chapter 13, verse 7. Mm -hmm. And there are gathered unto him vain men, Stop the right children here. of Belial. They are gathered unto him vain men, the children of Belial. Vain men, vain men. Keep that in mind. Now read verse 8. Verse 8. And mm -hmm. now he is think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hand of the sons of David. Come on. And ye be a great multitude. Ye be a what? And they are. And ye be a great multitude. So those vain men was a great multitude. That's why we read in verse 3. Read verse 3 again so we understand. Verse 3. And Abiah set the battle in array with an army of valiant men of war. Read. Even 400,000 took men. Come on. Jeroboam also set the battle in array against him with 800,000 chosen men, being mighty men of valor. You see that thing? So Jeroboam came with 800,000. So now those 800,000 were vain men in verse 7, and there, were, there is the multitude in verse 8. You understand? Now watch this. Give me Sarah chapter 16, verse 1. Ecclesiasticus chapter 16, verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 16, verse 1. Mm -hmm. Desire not a multitude of unprofitable children. You see what the Bible is saying? Neither delight in unprofitable. It says desire not, meaning don't desire them. I mean, Jeroboam came with 800,000. You understand? 800,000 vain men. That's the great multitude. You understand? But they were unprofitable sons. They were unprofitable children. You understand? Because they were wanting to work to go to war against Judah. You understand? Read it again, verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 16, verse 1. Read. Desire not a multitude of unprofitable children. Come on. Neither delight in ungodly sons. Don't delight in ungodly sons. There were all 800,000 ungodly sons. Read on. Come on. Though they multiply, rejoice not in them. Mm -hmm. 
except the fear of the Lord be with them. You see that thing? Except. Except the fear, except the fear of the Lord be with them. They, that means what? Jeroboam's uh, entourage did not have the fear of the Lord with them. That's why the Lord is in verse 1, he says, desire not a multitude of unprofitable children, neither delight in ungodly sons. Why? Because the fear of the Lord is not with them. They don't fear the Lord. They don't keep the commandments. Read verse 3. Trust not thou in their life, neither respect their multitude. For one that is just is better than a thousand. Stop right there. And That's better it is to die. Hold on. It says, trust not thou in their life, neither respect their multitude. For one that is just is better than a thousand. They had 800,000 and all of them were unjust. They were unprofitable sons. So it says, for one that is just is better than a thousand. Go ahead. And better it is to die without children than to have them that are ungodly. You see what the Lord is saying? He says, it's better to die not having children than to have them that are ungodly because they are unprofitable. You understand? That's what the Lord is saying right there. Watch this. Give me that in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1. Second Samuel chapter 15, verse 1. Read. Samuel also said unto Saul, Hold on. The second, Lord second, me... Hold on. Second Samuel chapter 15, verse 1. Stay with me. Second Samuel 15, okay. verse 1. Second Samuel chapter 15, verse 1. Come on. And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. So now this is Absalom, the son of David. He was allowed to come back. When he allowed, he was allowed to come back, he was going to do, he was doing some evil. He was, he was going behind his father's back to try to get people behind him. You understand? Go ahead. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. Mm. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. You see what Absalom was doing? He was arresting judgment. Give me that in Exodus real quick. Okay. Give me Exodus chapter 21. No, no. Exodus 23. Exodus chapter 23 and verse 1. Watch this. Exodus chapter 23, verse 1. Read. Thou shalt not raise a false report. Thou shalt not raise. Put not thy Thou shalt not. Hold on. Thou shalt not raise a false report. Go ahead. Thou shalt not raise a false report. Put mm. not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. He says, don't be an unrighteous witness. Now watch this. Next verse. Go ahead. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. You see that part right there? Don't follow a multitude to do evil. Unprofitable and ungodly sons. He says, don't follow a multitude to do evil. Watch what Absalom was doing. Go ahead. Neither shall thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. You see what the you see what he's saying? He says, Neither shall thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. That's what Absalom was doing. You understand? The people went to the king to get counsel and guidance and all of that. After he, they went to from after they left the king's. Uh, court, he spoke with them to do what? To rest judgment, to put doubt in their mind. That's what he was doing because he was trying to win the people over. Watch this. Go back to 2 Samuel, okay? 2 Samuel now, chapter 15 and verse 3. Second 
Second Samuel chapter 15, verse 3. Mm. And Absalom said unto him, See, Read. thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. You see what he's saying? There is no second in charge to the king that is going to hear the things that you had, that your cries, your complaints. You understand? So what was he saying indirectly? That the king was not listening to the people's causes. He was not helping them. You understand? He was a disrespectful Negro. Now watch this. Jump down to verse 10. I want to show you something. Read verse 10 now. Second Samuel chapter 15 verse 10. Read. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel saying, as soon as he hear the sound of the trumpet, then he shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. You see what he's saying? He says, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, because the sound of the trumpet was what? Preparation for war, the takeover. That's what he was doing. It says, then they knew. Um, what he says, is says, then he shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. Watch the next verse. Come on. And with Absalom went 200 men out of Jerusalem that mm -hmm. were called. And they went in their simplicity and they knew not anything. You see that part right there? It says they were 200 men, not 400, because I said 400, excuse me. It says 200 men out of Jerusalem that were called by who? Absalom. And they went in their simplicity and they knew not anything. They were dumb as hell. You understand? That's what was going on. Guess what? With Jeroboam, it was the same thing here going on. Okay? It was the same thing. Now go back to Second Chronicles. Go back to Second Chronicles chapter 13, verse 8. Second Chronicles chapter 13, verse 8. Read. And now ye think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hand of the sons of David. And ye be a great multitude, and there are with you golden calves, which Jeroboam made you for God. Remember, this great multitude is the vain man in verse 7. And guess what? They, what, what was their sin? What was the rebellion? He says, what? He says, there, he says, there are with you golden calves, which Jeroboam made for God. Made you for God. Watch this. Give me First Kings chapter 12, verse 25. I want to show you the reason why Jeroboam rebelled against Judah. He rebelled against the Lord by going against Judah. You understand? That was his rebellion. But what was the, the, what was the root cause of Jeroboam's rebellion? 1 Kings 12 verse 25. Watch this. 1 Kings chapter 12 verse 25. Go ahead. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein, and mm -hmm. went out from thence, and built Penuel. Now, this is Jeroboam. He's setting things up, okay? Remember, he was given 10 tribes because they rebelled against the house of David in First Kings chapter 12, verse 16. Go ahead. And Jeroboam said in his heart, He's, now shall on. the kingdom return wait. to the house of David. Wait, 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 wait. Read that again. Read it slow for me, Okay. First Kings chapter 12, verse 26. Read. And Jeroboam said in his heart. He said in his mind. Now, he said, shall hold on. He's thinking about this thing. Okay. And Jeroboam said in his heart. So he's imagining this stuff. He's imagining things now. Say, so wait a minute. You know, the people, they are going to go back to the kid. They're going to return to the house of David. Because remember... The sacrifices are performed where? In Jerusalem, because the temple was standing. You understand? So he's thinking this in his mind. You understand? Watch this. We're coming back here. Remember, we read in Sirach. Go back to Sirach. Read Sirach 3, 24. Okay? Sirach 3, verse 24. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 24. Go ahead. For many are deceived by their own vain opinion. Uh -huh. Read. And an evil suspicion. And an evil suspicion had overthrown their judgment. Read verse 24 again. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 24. Mm -hmm. 
for many are deceived by their own vain opinion. Come on. And an evil suspicion has overthrown their judgment. It says, and an evil suspicion have overthrown their judgment. So now, because they are deceived by their own vain opinion, right? And now, once they are deceived by their own vain opinion, now an evil suspicion enters into the mind and is going to overthrow their judgment. They're not going to make the right decisions. Watch this. Give me that in Wisdom of Solomon 2. Okay. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 2, verse 21. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 21. Read. Such things they did imagine and were deceived. Mm -hmm. For their own wickedness has blinded them. That's the reason why they have an evil suspicion, because their own wickedness has blinded them. So they don't see their own wickedness, because it has blinded them, because why? They are deceived by their own vain opinion. Watch this. Go back to 1 Kings 12, verse 26. Read that. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 26. Go ahead. And careful in his heart. Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. So he is imagining these things in his mind, right? Go ahead. Come on. If these people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, mm. then shall the heart of these people turn again unto their Lord. Read. Even unto Jeroboam, king of Judah. No, no. And they shall even, even unto even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. Read. And they shall even and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So now what is going on here is that Re Jeroboam is thinking in his mind, say, wait a minute. Now, if these people, if I allow these people to go back, you understand, to Jerusalem to perform sacrifices there. You, you see what he says? Then shall, there is, then shall the heart of these people turn again to their Lord. What is wrong with that? What is wrong with the people turning to the Lord? Jeroboam didn't want that. You understand? He didn't want the people to turn to the Lord because that's what we're reading here. It says, then shall they, the heart of these people turn again unto their Lord. You understand? Even unto Jeroboam, Rehoboam. He's thinking they are returning back to Rehoboam. No, they are returning back to the Lord. Not to Rehoboam. He says, they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So what was the problem that Jeroboam had? Jeroboam, he, he didn't like the fact that the kingdom of Judah is ruling. Also, the kingdom of, of Israel is ruling. He wanted all to be under the king, the northern kingdom. Well, that was against the prophecy. You understand? So he was going against what? He was going against the order. That's what Jer Jeroboam was doing. So the spirit that was operating in Jeroboam, the reason why he rebelled against the Lord is because of what? He wanted what? He wanted to rule over all Israel. That one, that was his problem. Now watch the next verse. Read verse 28. First Kings chapter 12, verse 28. Right. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two cows of gold mm. and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, mm. which brought me up out of the land of Egypt. You see what he's saying? He, because remember, he says, these things did he, in, did they imagine uh, because their own wickedness had blinded them. So Re Jeroboam was blinded by his own wickedness. But so much so that he took counsel with, uh, among, within himself. He imagined these things. And he made two calves of gold. He made two golden calves. You understand? It says, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Meaning it's too far. You understand? I'm going to make things easy for you. That's what he's telling them. Behold thy gods, O Israel. Look at your gods now, these two golden calves, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. So remember what we read in 2 Chronicles. It says, they men followed after Jeroboam. 
You understand? These were unprofitable and ungodly sons. Because why? They were moving in the same spirit that Jeroboam was moving in. The same spirit that uh, Absalom, the son of David, was moving in. Those 200 men that followed him, they also were dumb, just like Absalom was. So that's what we're reading here. Okay, come on. And he set the one in Bethel, and the mm -hmm. other put him in Dan. He says, one in Bethel, the other one is set in Dan. Go ahead. And this thing became a sin. Mm -hmm. For the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. You see that thing? The people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. So he made the people to sin. What was the sin? Idolatry. Idolatry was the sin. Idolatry was the sin. So the sin that was pushing Jeroboam to rebel against the king, the Lord by going against Judah, what was the problem? Idolatry. Idolatry was the problem that Jeroboam was dealing with. And that's the reason why he was causing problems. Idols. Idol worship. You understand? Give me that in Wisdom of Solomon chapter 14, verse 13. Okay. Start of his 12. Wisdom of Solomon. 12. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 14, verse 12. Read. Right. For the devising of idols was the beginning of spiritual fornication. Spiritual. And the invention. Spirit, hold on. Spiritual. You see that part? It says, for the devising of idols was the beginning of spiritual fornication. Spiritual fornication. The mind. That means the mind is full of demons. That's why it says spiritual fornication. You are fornicating with all these demons that are on you. You understand? You are in bed with them. That's spiritual fornication. Go ahead. And the invention of them, the corruption of life. So the invention of them, that means you have to sit down and invent and invent these idols that you are worshipping. You have to create things, make up stuff. It says what? The invention of them, the corruption of life. That means this man or this woman, their mind is corrupt. They are full of demons and they are in bed with these demons that are in their head, in their spirit, on their spirit. You understand? Read verse 14. Watch this. For by the vain glory of men, they enter into the world. Mm -hmm. And therefore shall they come shortly to an end. You see that part right there? For by the vain glory of men, they entered into the world. Now, that's the key I want to show you right there. You see, don't forget the thought what we're dealing with Jeroboam. Jeroboam wanted to be the center of attention. Guess what? What King Solomon is explaining here is saying, by the vain glory of men, they entered into the world. Vain glory of men. You understand? If you find yourself wanting to be the center of attention, and guess what? Being the center of attention is not a good thing. You understand? Because being the center of attention about evil stuff. Vain glory of men. Idolatry. The confusion is brought up by con confusion is brought up by what? Idolatry. Vain glory of men. You understand? If you want to, when you find yourself being the center of attention, there's always something with you. There's always, no, whenever you hear something, that brother right there, that sister, mm -hmm. vain glory of men. You understand? Why? Because they have no salt in themselves. They have no salt in themselves. You understand? And that's the reason why Jeroboam was causing so many problems because he had no salt in himself. You understand? So he was salting himself with evil so he can be the center of attention so that whenever we have to deal with stuff, he's always in, in the people's lips. You understand that? That's what he was doing. Like a child throwing tantrums. That's what Jeroboam was doing. That thing right there, that's the spirit of idolatry. You understand? That's the spirit of idolatry because you have no salt in yourself. Watch this. Now, let's go back. Go back to 1 Kings, okay? Give me 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 30 again. 
First Kings chapter 12, verse 30. Go ahead. And this thing became a sin. For the people went to worship before the one, even unto them. Mm -hmm. Next verse, come on. And he made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, mm. which were not of the sons of Levi. You see what he was doing? He kicked, he, guess what? He fired the priests. Because the priests didn't, they didn't sacrifice to idols. They didn't do that. That was not their office. That's not the office that the Lord gave to them. The office that the Lord gave to the priests was what? They must what? They must minister unto the Most High, and they have to be the sons of Aaron. It wasn't just any palm that he picked up. You understand? So what was what Jeroboam was doing, he guess he, he was just going the hell off. You understand? Because of what? Spiritual fornication. Vain glory. Now watch this. Give me the book of Wisdom of Solomon 15 verse 4. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 15 verse 4. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 15 verse 4. Go ahead. For neither did the mischievous invention of man deceive us. Stop right there. Stop right there. No. Neither, hold on. For neither did the mischievous invention of man deceive us. Remember what we read in chapter 14. It said, um, the, it says what? For the devising of idols, wisdom of Solomon 14 verse 12, for the devising of idols was the beginning of spiritual fornication and the invention of them, the corruption of life. So now these inventions, the, 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 these idols, they are the mischievous invention of men to deceive. Mischievous, meaning what? Mischief is always in the midst, you understand? To deceive men and women too, okay? Read verse four again, Wisdom of Solomon 15 verse four. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 15 verse four. Come on. Neither did the mischievous invention of men deceive us. Pray. Nor an image spotted with diverse colors, mm -hmm. a painter's fruitless labor. You see that thing? It says, nor an image spotted with diverse colors. Because these idols, they decorate them. You understand? They decorate them as if that thing has breath in it when it has none. The painter's fruitless is a fruitless labor. You understand? Meaning it's not going to profit you. Go ahead. The sight whereof entices fools to lust after it. Stop right there. Hmm. And Read stop. that part again. Hold on. Wait, wait. Stay with me. Is this the what? The sight whereof entices fools to lust after it. Stop right there. It says, the sight whereof enticed fools to lust after. Remember, by the vain glory of men, they were what? They were put to, they were created. By the vain glory of men, they entered into the world because they, in, men invented these things mischievously. So the Lord is saying, the sight whereof enticed fools to lust after it. Remember, this, these are idols, right? You can have idols in your head, like you read in Ezekiel 14. Idols in your mind. Those are vain opinions. You understand? So the sight thereof entice. That means you have to see this thing. It can be a woman. It can be a man. It can be a brother in the congregation. It can be a woman in the congregation. Guess what? He is the painter's fruitless labor. Why? He is the painter's fruitless labor because why? You lust after this woman. You lust, uh, you lust after this man. You understand? I'm going to the marriage stuff now. I'm, let me come back. But I'm giving an example. You understand? Because guess what? They want to be the center of attention. Get, and that spirit is not the spirit of the Lord. That's the spirit of Satan. You understand? That's the spirit of Satan. It says, the sight whereof enticed fools to lust after it. So the key word is lust, which is idolatry. Okay, read verse 5 again. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 15, verse 5. Mm -hmm. The sight whereof enticed fools to lust after it. Read. 
and saw the desire, the form of the dead image that had no breath. That has no breath, no knowledge in it. Go ahead. Both they that make them, they that desire them. They that what? And they that worship them. They that desire them. Remember, it says both they that make them. Where do you make it? Now it's, remember, it's a spiritual fornication. It's in your spirit, it's in your mind. You understand? Bo both they that make them. You understand? Both they that make them, because you want to be the center of attention, that's the idol that you have made. And they that desire them, because you desire that idol that you've made and you want others to do the same. You understand? When you don't get the attention, you throw ten traps. Okay? And they that worship them. When you worship, what does it, when you worship them, what happens? You rebel against the Lord. You understand? You rebel against the Lord. You do whatever the hell you want. Because you have no salt in yourself. You do whatever the hell you want. It says what? It says um, they that worship them. Because when you worship something, there's customs, there's, there's rituals that goes with it. You understand? Rebellion. Witchcraft. That's what Jeroboam was doing. That's the reason why Jeroboam was causing problems with the kingdom of Judah. Because why? He had no salt in himself. So he had to find another way of salting himself with evil. But he was salting himself with evil. You understand? He was causing confusion. All right? Read. And they that desire them and they that worship them mm. are lovers of evil things. Stop right there. They are lovers of evil things. Jeroboam was a lover of evil things. Now, when we fast forward to today, I'm coming there. Give me a second. It says they are lovers of evil. They love evil things. You see the keyword right there says love. These are lovers of evil things. You understand? Read that part again. They are what? They are, are lovers of evil things. Read. And are worthy to have such things to trust upon. And they are worthy to have such things to trust upon. But the Lord says you deserve to worship that stuff. You understand? Because you decided to choose something else that I did not command you to choose. Guess what? You, are, you deserve to worship that thing. That's what the Lord is teaching us right there. Now, go back to 2 Chronicles 13. Read verse 9 now. 2 Chronicles chapter 13 verse 9. Watch this. 2 Chronicles chapter 13 verse 9. Mm -hmm. Have you not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and have made you priests after the manner of the nations of other lands, mm -hmm. so that whosoever cometh to consecrate himself with a young bullock and seven rams, the same may be a priest of them that are no gods. You see that thing? The same may be a priest of them that are no gods. What is that? The two golden calves that he put one in Bethel, the other put he in Dan. Because guess what? He imagined this stuff. He said, I don't want the people to seek after the Lord, I want, but I want the people to seek after these two golden calves. And I'm going to convince them that these two calves is what delivered you out of Egypt. Because why? Because the people also, their minds was bugged out. You understand? Watch this. Give me Second Chronicles 11 verse 13. Second Chronicles chapter 11 verse 13. Read. And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their coasts. Because guess what? Jeroboam, he kicked them out. He, he, put, other, he put bombs in their place. Read. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and mm. came to Judah and Jerusalem. Read. For Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. You see what Jeroboam did? He fired the priests, the sons of Levi. Because whoever came, the bombs that he set up, 
it says they sacrifice unto them that are no gods, like we read in chapter 13. Read. And he ordained him priests for the high places mm -hmm. and for the devils and for the calves which he had made. And for the calves which he had made. Because Jeroboam was an idolater. And that's the reason why he was always causing problems against Southern Kingdom. You understand? Because Jeroboam was a lover of evil things. Watch this. Now, go back to Second Chronicles chapter 13 now. Go back to chapter 13. Read chapter 13 and verse 5 now. Second Chronicles chapter 13 verse 5. Read. Ought you not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons by a covenant of salt? You see that thing? And to his sons by a covenant of salt. Because Jeroboam was fighting against the prophecy. You understand? Read again. Read verse 4 and 5 together. Second Chronicles chapter 13 verse 4. Mm -hmm. And Abiah stood up upon Mount Zemarim, which is in Mount Ephraim, and said, Hear me, thou Jeroboam, and all Israel. Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons by a covenant of salt? You see what he's saying? It says the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him, meaning David, and to his sons, that goes into Solomon, and the sons of Solomon, which went into Rehoboam, then now Abiah, because he's coming out of that lineage. You understand? And to his sons by a covenant of salt. Now I'm going to pause right there. Now we will deal with this. It says, what? Um, or do you not to know that um, I would you not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever? Watch this. Give me 2 Samuel chapter 7. Okay, 2 Samuel 7 and verse 12. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 12. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 12. Read. And when thy days be fulfilled, mm -hmm. and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. So now, this is, the, this is Nathan now speaking to David about what the Lord has said, what will happen to him after he dies. Go ahead. He shall build a house for my name, uh -huh, and that goes I into, will establish the throne. That goes into King Solomon. It says, he shall build a house for my name. King Solomon did that thing. Remember, read verse 12 again so we can get it. Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Mm -hmm. And when thy days be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. Meaning what David I will dies. set up thy seed. David dies, is that the Lord says, I, I will what? I will set up thy seed after thee. You see what he's saying? I will set up thy seed after thee. The seed, the seed of David, come on. Which shall proceed out of thy powers. Uh -huh. And I will establish his kingdom. He says, your seed that will come after you will proceed out of your bowels, meaning out of your sperm, your penis. He says, I will establish his kingdom. The seed that will come out of David that will sit on the throne. Go ahead. He shall build a house for my name. Stop right there. So this seed that will proceed out of David's bowels, it says, he shall build a house for my name. You understand? Going into King Solomon. Go ahead. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So now this goes into Christ. But what I'm showing you is that the seed that will come after out of David, out of his bowels, you understand? He will build the name of the Lord. He will build the house of the Lord. King Solomon did that. And the children of Solomon, you understand? What we're reading about in Second Chronicles 13 is the son of Rehoboam. 
Rehoboam was the son of King Solomon. So now he's talking about the, the sons that will come out, out of David, you understand, that will sit on the throne. Jeroboam was against that. You understand, that was his problem. Now watch this. Go back to 2 Chronicles 13 verse 5. Because if he was using the scriptures to understand this, there wouldn't be confusion. The key word is what? He wasn't using the scriptures. He ignored what was written. He was following his own vain opinion. 2 Chronicles 13 verse 5 again. 2 Chronicles 13 verse 5. Mm -hmm. Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons by a covenant of salt? So now we dealt with that when it says he gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever. Now watch this. Jump down to verse 10, 2 Chronicles 13, verse 10. We coming back to verse 5. I just wanted to deal with that part where he was he was promised the sons that will come, the sons that will come out of him, meaning himself and his sons after him. Goes into King Solomon, Rehoboam, Abiah, and so forth. Okay? Read verse 10. Come on. Second Chronicles chapter 13, verse 10. But Read. as for us, the Lord is our God. Mm -hmm. And we have not forsaken him. Read. And the priests which minister unto the Lord are the sons of Aaron, and the Levites wait upon their business. You see now, you see what uh, Ab you see what Abiah is telling him. Is a listen, eh, but as for us, meaning Judah, the Lord is our God. You understand? We have not forsaken him. Meaning the pre and it says, and the priests which minister unto the Lord are the sons of Aaron. Because unlike Jeroboam, the priests were not the sons of Levi. They were not the sons of Aaron. No, no, were they ministering unto the Lord. They were ministering unto those two golden calves that Jeroboam has set up. You understand? Come on. Verse 11. And they burn unto the Lord every morning and every evening, burnt sacrifices and sweet incense. Mm-hmm. The shoe bread also set they in order upon the pure table and the candlestick of gold with the lamps thereof to burn every evening. For we keep the charge of the Lord our God, but ye have forsaken him. So he's telling him twice that you forsook the Lord. And that's the reason why in verse 4, I mean verse 3, he's causing confusion. He went to go, he went to go, he went to war with Abiah. You understand? Because of what he was an idolater. He rebelled against the Lord. Now watch this. Give me 2 Chronicles 24, verse 1. 2 Chronicles 24, verse 1. 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 1. Read. George was seven years old when he began to reign. Mm -hmm. And he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Zephiah of Beersheba. Read. And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. So now Joash was the king over Judah at this point, and Jehoiada the priest was his counselor. It says he did that which was right in the, in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Right? Watch this. Jump down to verse 15 now. Verse 15. Mm -hmm. But Jehoiada was old and was full of days when he died. And 130 years old was he when he died. Read. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and toward his house. So now Jehoiada was an honorable man. He was a righteous man. You understand? But now he died. Watch what happens after his death. Read. Now, after the death of Jehoiada, came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened unto them. So the king, jo Joash, he hearkened to these men after Jehoiada died. Go ahead. 
And they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols. They did what? And served groves and idols. Now read the verse again from the top. And they what? And they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers mm. and served groves and idols. You see what they did? So what, Reu, what, what Abiah was telling Jeroboam, he said, you forsook the Lord. How did he forsake the Lord? Well, that's what we're reading here. He says, they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols. They went into idolatry, hence the confusion. You understand? Because Jeroboam was a lover of evil things, groves and idols. Read. And rest came upon Judah and Jerusalem for these their trespass. That's the, that's the same thing that happened to, to Northern Kingdom because Judah started to follow after that foolishness. But what I'm showing here is, is an example of, of what Abiah is saying to Jeroboam, saying, you forsook the Lord. How? Because they started to serve groves and idols. You understand? Read verse 19. Yet he spent prophets to them. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord. Mm. And they testified against them, but they would not give ear. They would not give ear. So they were not wise because they were foolish men. Like we read in Matthew 7, 24. You understand, 25. They were foolish. They were not wise men because they were, not, they were supposed to hear and increase learning. They did not do that. So now the Lord sent the prophets. They rejected them. Go ahead. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith God, why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord that ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. That's exactly what happened to Jeroboam. Because Jeroboam forsook the Lord, the Lord forsook him also. You understand? Read that again. There's no such thing God loves me no matter what. That's not in the Bible. Read verse 20, read verse 20 again. Second Chronicles chapter 24 verse 20. Read. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which mm -hmm. stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith God, why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord that ye cannot prosper? Because ye have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. That's some heavy stuff right there. Now go back to Second Chronicles chapter 13 now. Second Chronicles chapter 13. Um, read verse 12 now. Second Chronicles chapter 13 verse 12. Read. And behold, God himself is with us for our captain and his mm. priests with sounding trumpets to cry alarm against you. Mm -hmm. O children of Israel, fight ye not against the Lord God of your fathers, for ye shall not prosper. That's the same thing we read in 2 Chronicles 24. So the reason why Abiah is saying, listen, we're going to sound the trumpets against you and alarm against you because what? We, we're going to war. You understand? The Lord is with us. So now he's telling them, all children of Israel, fight ye not against the Lord, your, the Lord God of your fathers, for ye shall not prosper. Don't fight with the Lord. So guess what? Coming back to today now, because I'm giving you the history of what happened to the past, and they did not prosper when they went against the Lord. You understand? What I'm bringing to you, brothers and sisters, is to understand something. In this truth, we have to deal right with one another. You understand? We have to deal right with each other. Now, watch this. Read that again. Mm, let, me not, let me not jump ahead. Verse 12, once again. Second Chronicles, chapter 13, verse 12. Go ahead. And behold, God himself is with us for our captain. Mm. And his priests would sound the trumpets to cry alarm against you. O children of Israel, fight ye not against the Lord, the Lord God of your fathers, for ye shall not prosper. Mm. 
ye shall not prosper. Go ahead. But Jeroboam caused an ambush about behind them. Come on. So they were before Judah, and the ambushment was behind them. So now, Abiah, he keeps telling Jeroboam to get his mind right. He did not want to do that. Instead, he caused more harm than good. You understand? So what we are seeing here says, but Jeroboam caused an ambushment, meaning he what? He ambushed them to come about behind them. So they were before Judah and the ambushment was behind them. So now they have Judah surrounded. Okay, come on. Verse, 5, verse 14, read. And when Judah looked back, behold, the battle was before and behind. And they cried unto the Lord, and the priest sounded with the trumpets. And the priest sounded with the trumpets, meaning what? Prepare is now is war time. Because remember that we blow the trumpet because it's war time. It's time for war. Now watch the next verse. Come on. Then the man of Judah gave a shout. Mm -hmm. And as the man of Judah shouted, it came to pass that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abiah and Judah. You see who you, you see who smote Jeroboam? The Lord did that. It wasn't Abiah. The Lord did that because when Judah shouted the, shouted the trumpet, they were sending a signal to the Lord, says, fight for us. And guess what? He says, it came to pass that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abiah and Judah. The Lord did that thing. You understand? Because they gave glory to the God of heaven and earth. Okay, come on. And the children of Israel fled before Judah. And God delivered them into their hand. So now what I'm showing you is that when you go against the order that is set up in the camp, you do your own thing. You do however the hell you want. Guess what? You're not fighting against leadership. You're not fighting against this movement. You are fighting against the most High God himself. And the Lord will smite you. And we, everybody going to see that thing. You understand? Because Israel doesn't listen. Israel does not listen. Keep going. And Abia and his people threw them with a great slaughter. Mm -hmm. So there fell down slain of Israel 500,000 chosen men. Remember, Jeroboam came with 800,000. Now there's only what? There's only 300,000 left. 500,000 have been put to death. You understand? Because think about it like this, right? We just came from the Day of Atonement. I'm not expecting any garbage and BS up in here. The Day of Atonement is now. Nah, we just came from it. You understand? But one year out the other, we still don't get it. Keep going. Read. Thus the children of Israel were brought under at that time. And the children of Judah prevailed. Because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. Mm-hmm. You see that thing right there? It says, because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. We relied upon the Lord. We rely upon the Most High God. You understand? So whenever you go against the order that we set up, guess what? You're fighting against the Most High, like we read in 2 Chronicles 18, verse 12. You're fighting against the Most High God, and you are not going to prosper. The mission is a go. Understand that thing? That's why it is because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. So it is today. Go ahead. Verse 19. Come on. And Abiah pursued after Jeroboam and took cities from him, Bethel with the towns thereof, and Jeshana with the towns thereof, and Ephraim with the towns thereof. We were taking over. Come on. Neither did Jeroboam recover strength again in the days of Abiah. And the Lord struck him and he died. You see what happened? He says, neither did Jeroboam recover strength again in the days of Abai. And the Lord struck him and he died. He dropped dead. So when you go against the order, guess what? You are making the Lord angry. And this is what the Lord does. You're not going to recover strength, meaning what? The Lord will not give you the spirit to repent. The most High God will not, he will allow you to die in your sin. Why? Because you're going against the movement. You understand? You are counter-revolutionary to this movement. 
That's what the Lord is showing us. Now watch this. Give me, go back, jump up to verse 5. Let me deal with this now. Now I'm painting you the history, what Jeroboam was trying to do and he failed. And what was his problem? Idolatry. That caused him to do what? To cause confusion. So it is today. Read that. Second Chronicles 13 verse 5. Come on. Second Chronicles chapter 13 verse 5. Read. Ought ye not to know the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons by a covenant of salt? I'll read that part again. Even to what? Even to him and to his sons by a covenant of salt. So now the most High God, he gave unto Israel, you understand, a covenant of salt. He gave us the covenant of salt. What does that mean, a covenant of salt? Because I was showing you the lack of salt in Jeroboam's spirit. He didn't have, he didn't have salt. That's why Abaya had to remind him, listen, we have a covenant of salt and the kingdom was given to Judah. You understand? Because of David. Okay, watch this. Now give me Mark 9, 49. Now. Watch this. Mark chapter 9, verse 49. So Abiah, he's speaking over him, but he's also giving what? He is telling him, he's speaking over, he's, he's going over his head what he's saying, but he's also explaining to him the reason why he's not considering that covenant of salt that was given to us by the Lord. Mark chapter 9, verse 49. Read that. Mark chapter 9, verse 49. Come on. For everyone shall be salted with fire. Mm -hmm. And every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Read that again, verse 49. Mark chapter 9, verse 49. For everyone shall be salted with fire. And every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. So now the Lord says, everyone shall be salted with fire. The everyone is the every sacrifice. So, so for everyone shall be salted with fire and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. So the everyone in the beginning of the verse is the every sacrifice towards the end of the verse. Every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. You understand? The fire, give me that in Jeremiah 5, 14. Okay, read that. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 14. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 14. Read. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because he speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and these people would, and shall devour them. You see what he's saying? He says, I will make my words in thy mouth fire. So the word of the Most High God is a fire. You understand? That's the fire right there that we're reading in Mark 9. Go back to Mark chapter 9, verse 49. The book of Mark chapter 9, verse 49. Go ahead. For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. And every sacrifice shall be what? And every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. And every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. So this sacrifice right here is talking about what? The everyone. It says every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. So the sacrifice today is talking about who? Give me that in Romans 12. Okay. Romans 12 and verse 1. Romans chapter 12 verse 1. Read. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, mm. that he present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So you see what the Lord is saying? He's speaking through the Apostle Paul now. He says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. So the sacrifice that Christ is talking about in the book of Mark He's talking about us. We are that sacrifice. You understand? It says that we must present our bodies a living sacrifice. That sacrifice that we present, which is our body, it says it must be holy. 
And not only that, it must be acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. So this sacrifice, it must be holy. You understand? It says, holy, acceptable unto God. Now watch this. Give me the book of Romans, okay? Mm. Give me Romans. Give me Romans uh, chapter 7, okay, verse 12. Romans chapter 7, verse 12. Come on. Wherefore, the law is holy, mm -hmm. and the commandment holy, and just, and good. So now, this sacrifice, it says it must be holy. That means it must what? It must, that sacrifice for it must be holy. That it must be according to the law. You understand? The commandment holy, it must be according to the commandment. It must be just and it must be good. According to the law and according to the commandment, it must be just and good according to the law and the commandments. So go back to Romans 12 now, verse 1 again. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Mm -hmm. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So this sacrifice, which is our bodies now, you understand, a living sacrifice. It says it must be holy, acceptable unto God. The only way it's going to be acceptable is going to be holy is according to the law and the commandments. It must be according to the law and the commandments. Then that sacrifice is sorted with salt. You understand? That sacrifice is sorted with salt because what is the salt? The laws of God, that's the salt. You understand? So that sacrifice, it must be holy and acceptable. Go back to go back to Mark now, chapter 9, verse 49 again. Chapter 9, verse 49. For everyone shall be salted with fire, mm -hmm. and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. And every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Now watch this. Um, give me the book of Proverbs 21, verse 3. Watch this. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 3. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 3. Wait. To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. You see, to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Because now, these sacrifices that we are doing now, you understand, these are spiritual sacrifices. Give me that in First Peter. We're coming back here to Proverbs. Okay, First Peter. First Peter 2. Read verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Read. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up, are built up a spiritual house, a what? and holy priesthood, and holy priesthood. No, no, no. It says, I build up a what? Are built up a spiritual house. He says, We are building up a spiritual house. The same house that Christ was talking about in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 down. You understand? That must be built upon the rock, which is Christ. So, where when we build these spiritual houses, he says, I build up a spiritual house. So, our bodies now, this is a spiritual house. You understand? A spiritual house. Read that again, verse 5. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Come on. Ye also, as lively stones, Ray. are built up a spiritual house mm -hmm. and holy priesthood Ray. to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. This is the same thing that the Apostle Paul just said in Romans 12. The same thing. The Apostle Peter is repeating the same thing. That he says, as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood. That means that spiritual house, guess what? It must be holy. You understand? 
to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So the spiritual sacrifices, guess what those spiritual sacrifices are that are acceptable to God by Jesus Christ? Go back to Proverbs 21 verse 3. These are the spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 3. Ray. To do justice in judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Because this sacrifice right here is making reference to animal sacrifice. We are no longer under the, in the law of animal sacrifice, but we are under grace. You understand? And under grace, we must what do justice and judgment, which is more acceptable than the blood of bulls and goats, like we read about in Hebrews 10. So now the sacrifices that now we offer now is our bodies. And those sacrifices, they are spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable as we are building up these spiritual houses. Give me that in Judith 16 verse 16. Judith 16 verse 16. Read that. The book of Judith chapter 16 verse 16. Mm -hmm. For all sacrifice is too little for a sweet savor unto thee. Ray. And all the fat is not sufficient for thy burnt offering. But he that feareth the Lord is great at all times. You see that thing? It says, for all sacrifices eat too little for a sweet savor unto thee. Because it's going into animal sacrifices. And all the fat is not sufficient for thy burnt offerings. Because that's where the sweet smell and savor would come from. From the fat. But he that feareth the Lord is great at all times. You understand? Keeping God's commandment is forever. That's why the law of animal sacrifice was what? Was not forever. However, we are now the sacrifice now. And the sec we are now the, the living sacrifice. And the spiritual sacrifices that we must what? We must, we, must, we must give to the Lord. They must be holy. How? According to the law and the commandments. You understand? That's the salt. That is the salt right there. You understand? Watch this. Give me. Go back to Mark 9. Mark chapter 9. Let's go back there. Mark chapter 9. Verse 49 again. Mark chapter 9. Verse 49. Read. For everyone shall be salted with fire. And every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. And every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. So now, the only way you are going to be salted with salt is that you must present your body as a living sacrifice that is acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. The salt right here is the laws of God. That's the salt. The salt right here is God's commandments. Next verse. Come on. Verse 50. Salt is good, mm -hmm. but if the salt have lost its saltiness, wherewith will you season it? Stop right there. Is the salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltness, wherewith will you season it? Now that's heavy right there. How are you going to season it? How are you going to have salt in yourself? How are you going to have salt without the laws of God? Because God's commandments, that's the, guess what? That's the salt. So that when you are now that living sacrifice, you can have salt in yourself. You understand? Watch this. Give me Matthew 5 verse 13. We're coming back here. Matthew chapter 5 verse 13. Mm -hmm. Ye are the salt of the earth. Mm. But if salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be sorted? It stands forth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You see what he's saying? He says, ye are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. Now, we use this verse all the time about we, are, we give the world flavor, which is correct. Now, watch this. Give me Psalms 85 verse 11. We coming back here. Psalms chapter 85, verse 11. I'm going to show you something this day. Watch this. Psalms 
Psalms 85, verse 11. The book of Psalms, chapter 85, verse 11. Go ahead. Truth shall spring out of the earth. Come on. And righteousness shall look down from heaven. You see what the Bible is saying? It says, truth shall spring out of the earth. Truth shall spring out of the earth. First and foremost, the earth is this Bible. The earth is this holy Bible. The truth is the laws of God. Give me that in Psalms 119 verse 142. Psalms chapter 119 verse 142. Read. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. And mm. thy law is the truth. And thy law is the what? And thy law is the truth. And thy law is the truth. Thy law is the truth. Go back to Psalms 85 verse 11 again. Psalms chapter 85 verse 11. Mm -hmm. Truth shall spring out of the earth. Come on. And righteousness shall be down from heaven. It says the law shall spring out of the earth. So what is the earth? In this context, the word of God, the Bible. The Bible is the earth. It says the law shall spring out of the earth, out of this Bible. You understand? And righteousness shall look down from heaven. Watch this. So go back. Go back to uh, Matthew 5, verse 13. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Read. Ye are salt of the earth. Ye are the what? But if the salt have lost his savor, ye are the salt of the earth. So God is saying we are the salt of the earth. So what is he saying? Remember he said have salt in yourself. Have salt in yourself, meaning keep the commandments. When you keep the commandments, guess what? It says you are the salt of the earth. Guess what? You are the one that give this Bible flavor. Because the Bible is about Israel. We are, the, we, are the, we are the people that give this Bible meaning. That's why the Bible is read throughout the churches, but it does not have meaning to the people that read it because they are not the salt of the earth. They are not the subject matter of this book. You understand? So Christ is saying, we are the salt of the earth. We are the subject matter of this Bible. We give this Bible meaning because we are the people of this book. We give it meaning. We know how to explain it in the spirit of Christ. That's what he's saying right there. So now imagine when you go against the order, you are saying, I'm blotting my name out of this book. Therefore, you're not going to have flavor. You're not going to have salt in your spirit. You are going to be saltless. And what's going to replace, what's going to be there in place of the salt that you're supposed to be or supposed to have? Because it's both. You are the salt and the salt must be in you. So you can have savor. You can have taste. You understand? Guess what? The minute you go outside of this book, Guess what? You are blotting your name out of this book. That means your life has no meaning anymore. You are useless to the Lord. You are worthless to the Most High when you are no longer moving according to this Bible right here. You understand? That's why it says, have salt in yourself. Read that again, verse 13. Ye are the what? Ye are the salt of the earth. Mm-hmm. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Come on. It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You see what? The, this is Christ speaking. It says, it is thenceforth good for nothing. So now, when you decide, I don't want to do what this Bible is saying. I want to complain. I want to murmur. You understand? Guess what? You are good for nothing, the Lord is saying. Good for nothing. The Lord is saying, the minute you be complaining about the things that are required of you according to this Bible, you be complaining. God says you are good for nothing. But to be cast out, meaning what? To be kicked out, to be killed, and to be trodden under foot of men. Spiritual death, and the nations will walk all over you once again. That's what he's saying right there. So he's telling us, listen, you are the subject matter. You give this Bible meaning because you are Israel. And the most High God has given you the law because that's your salt. That's your savor. Because I guess salt has savor. 
it's got a taste. You understand? That's the good savor. We are that good savor. We give this Bible meaning. Without Israel, this Bible has no meaning. Because we move in the spirit of the Lord. That's the salt. And we are the salt. You understand? Watch this. Go back to Mark 9. Okay? Mark, 9, chap Mark chapter 9, verse, verse, verse 50. Mark 9, verse 50. Read that. Mark chapter 9, verse 50. Mm -hmm. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltiness, wherewith will you sin it? Have salt in yourselves and have mm -hmm. peace one with another. Now that's it right there. You see that part right there? And have peace one with another. Hmm. That's some heavy stuff right there. So for you, in order for you to have peace with your neighbor, you have to have salt in yourself. If you cannot have peace with your brother or your sister, you have no salt in yourself. You are flavorless. That means you are not in this Bible. You are not keeping the Bible. You know, do you believe, but you are playing a part. You are putting on a show, but you don't believe it. You don't believe what is written. Because guess what? If you have no peace one with your neighbor, you don't have the laws of God in you. You do not have the laws of God in your spirit. You understand? Read that thing again, verse 50. Mark chapter 9, verse 50. Go ahead. Salt is good. Mm. But if the salt have lost its saltness, wherewith will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. That's what Abaya was teaching Jeroboam, but he didn't get it. Christ is teaching us right here again. He says, have salt in yourself because we were given the covenant of salt, peace one with another. And that right there, that's what Jeroboam did not understand because Jeroboam's spirit, he was moving with the spirit of Satan. Hatred, jealousy, anger, holding grudges. That was the spirit of Jeroboam. You understand? So it is with men and women in this truth this day. They don't want to have peace one with another because they've forgotten the covenant of Saul. Now they are idolaters. You understand? They're committing idolatry, spiritual fornication. You understand? Why? Because they want to be the center of attention. Vain glory. That's why these things are happening this day. You understand? So watch this. Give me the book of Matthew chapter 5 verse 9. Read that. Matthew chapter 5 verse 9. Mm -hmm. Blessed are the peacemakers, mm. for they shall be called the children of God. Read it again. The book of Matthew chapter 5 verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. It says, blessed are the peacemakers, because why? The peacemakers, they have sold within themselves. That's why they are the peacemakers. They have sold. Then it says, because for they shall be called the children of God. So that means if you don't want to make peace with your neighbor, that means you are not the child of God. You are the child of the devil. Let me say that again in case I start. You don't want to make peace with your neighbor. You are the children of Satan. You are the devil. And the devil is your father. He's your daddy. He's your pappy. Read that again, verse 9. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Go ahead. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Because they shall be called the children of God. Whenever you cannot resolve issues with your brother, you cannot resolve issues with your brother, you, have, you are the child of the devil. That's what Christ, this is Christ speaking, by the way. For they shall be called the children of God. So you don't want to be a peacemaker. You don't want, because you don't have, you, because you don't have salt in yourself. Neither do you want the salt. Because the salt, that's how you are going to what? That's how you be, you'll become that acceptable sacrifice that will be what? That will, the Lord will accept. You'll be that sacrifice that the Lord will accept. But because you don't want the salt, guess what? You're not going to have peace with your neighbor. Therefore, that makes you the child of Satan. You understand? The devil is your father. Now watch this. Here's another thing. 
Okay. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying this day. Watch this. Here's another one that I've seen, especially during the, 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 the preparation time. Hmm. Give me the book of Numbers chapter 11. You know what? Give me John 6. I think I love John 6. Give me John chapter 6 real quick. Okay. Where Christ says, Mama, ye not amongst yourselves. Watch this. Mm, John chapter 6. John 6. You know what I want, right? He says, Mama, ye not amongst yourselves. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I didn't write it down, so it just popped into my head, actually. Um, in John 6, nobody knows what I'm talking about? Uh, uh, come on. Brothers, verse what verse is that? that? Yes, John let's read it. Uh -huh, read it. The book of John. John chapter 6, verse 43. Go ahead. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Mama mm. not among yourselves. He says, Mama not, Mama not amongst yourselves. Mama not amongst yourselves. Read that again. The book of John, chapter 6, verse 43. Go ahead. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Mama not among yourselves. Now jump down to verse 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured it, he said to them, Does this offend you? You see where the memory, you see the root of memory is offend, being offended. That's the root cause of memory, being offended. Because you don't like what is coming out of the book. You don't like what is written. That's why. Read that again. Verse 61. John. Chapter 6, verse 61. Go ahead. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples remembered it, he said unto them, does this offend you? Does this offend you? Now, here's the thing. You know, where a lot of the times, right, we come in together to teach the gospel of Christ. We come in together in the spirit of Christ. Guess what? There are times, especially in captivity, we're going to need arms. What I'm seeing so far is that some brothers, when you lead out from them, they have the spirit of hesitancy. They hesitate. Why? Because you are murmuring within yourself. You are complaining. Because you, are, you don't fully understand this, nor do you fully believe this. Let me tell you something, you men. Okay? This movement... Sometimes we're going to need arms to get things done. If you think that's not, good, that's not required, you don't believe, you don't understand what this Bible is about. You understand? Because complaining is a default setting in the black man and the black woman, but I'm dealing with the black man right now. You say you want to be a leader, but you see the problems in your nation. You don't want to put your hand in your pocket to help your nation. Guess what? You don't believe this truth. You don't deserve to be a leader. Why? Because we need arms to get certain things done in the body. Some brothers, they have the spirit of murmuring and complaining. You understand? So which spirit are you moving in? Because that's not the spirit of Christ. That's not the spirit of Christ. I'm going to show you something. Because we are on the Feast of Tabernacles. And a lot of you have never attended it, but you are complaining. Which means... You don't spiritually, you don't really believe that you should be attending it, but physically you want to be there because guess what? Give me that scripture. I think it's John 6, 24. Give me that in John 6, 24. Watch this. Read that thing for me. Uh -huh, read it. John chapter 6, verse 24. Go ahead. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, mm -hmm. after his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. They were looking for Christ, right? Next verse, come on. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? He says, when camest thou hither? Master, when camest thou hither? Go ahead. Jesus answered him and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, 
not because he saw the miracles, but because he did eat of the loaves and were filled. You see that thing? That's the reason why he's saying what he's saying. He said, the reason why you are following is not because of the works. It's not because of the laboring in this truth. It's not because of the mission. It's because what? He says, because he did eat of the loaves and were filled. So although you give alms, but you have a complaining spirit, the Lord sees that too. You are not a cheerful giver. That means you are cheap. Listen, I'm going to tell you about how we first started in this truth and how we've been doing ever since before you came. We would, if I, I know about, we would sell our own things. You understand? The things that don't mean nothing when it comes to the truth. We would sell our own things to make sure that we buy uniforms. We would sell our own things to make sure we help a brother in the truth who does not have food or transport to go to work. We would sell our own possessions that because we were not attached to them. You understand? We would do that thing. That's the spirit that we, that's the spirit that is in here in Soldiers of Christ. Sold our own possessions because we believe in this thing. So when I hear a brother just be complaining, you understand? We need 250, we need this. Uh, uh, in your teaching like a robot, you don't believe this stuff. Why? Because I'm seeing that I'm thinking to myself, well, what the hell is this? You say you want to be a leader in Israel, but guess what? Something as simple as that, you don't believe that the Lord can bless you more. You don't get that. That actually you making those decisions, you're going to be able to, uh, to teach others to do the same so we can build a nation. But that's not the mindset that I'm seeing so far with some, not all, some brothers. That complaining, murmuring spirit. You, Because I can see it. I can even tell you spirit. Mm, that brother, he don't believe nothing. But Christ, he talked about this thing. He says, because, he says what? Because he did eat of the loaves and were filled. You're only here because of the food. You understand? We are all coming together. We are eating because it's a feast. But you don't really believe the mission. You understand? You put your hand to the plow, but you are looking back. Because spiritually, you are Lord's wife. You understand? So, two things I'm seeing. Sisters who do not know how to use the scriptures to get their minds right, have peace with one another. They don't know how to do that. Brothers complaining, but you say you want to be a leader in Israel. I don't understand that. You understand? We have a nation to build. It's nation building time. Some of you think, you know, it's just a cash phrase. No, it's not a cash phrase. Okay? It's not a cash phrase. We really are building a nation from the ground up in the spirit of Christ. And we are going to do it with or without you. Understand that thing. Okay? Read that thing again, verse 26. Because Christ, he addressed this thing. Because that was the spirit of our people back then is the spirit of our people today. Same thing. Read that thing again, verse 26. John, chapter 6, verse 26. Read. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, is me not because he saw the miracles, but because he did eat of the loaves and were filled. You see that thing? It says, but because he did eat of the loaves and were filled. Meaning what? It's all carnal with you. It's not spiritual at all. You understand? Next verse. Go ahead. Labor not for the meat which perishes. You see that, Peter? Right but there? for that not, meat, hold on. Endure. It says, but it says, labor not for the meat which perisheth. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is because some of you are so attached to the things of this world, right? So much so that when it comes to building your nation up, listen, me, I don't think twice, yeah. If I have to let go of my position so I can make money, you know, I can get money so that I can help my name, I will do it. Why? Because I'm not attached to that thing. I can always get another one later on. I don't have to worry about that. Why? Because I know the needs now, they outweigh my current wants right now. So the needs of the, of the operation of the mission, they are now, and then my wants will be later. And guess what? That's how the Lord is going to grow us as a nation. But we've been, so, we have, we've been so conditioned to be selfish. You are like that Bugs Bunny. You, know, you ever seen that Bugs Bunny cartoon? You understand? That Bugs Bunny cartoon. There's a scene where he likes to say, mine, 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 mine. You're doing that spiritually, though. 
because you don't believe this book with a bottle of blue on your shirt. You don't believe it. Read that thing again, verse 27. John chapter 6, verse 27. Read. Labor not for the meat which perishes, Go ahead. but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Mm -hmm. Which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for he has God the Father sealed. You see that thing? For him has God the Father sealed. And one thing that really gets, it really pushes my buttons is the fact that all the arms, they actually, they are, I'm not benefiting from none of them. No, it's for the whole nation. Everything that whatever we do with the arms, you can see the stuff we're doing with it. And we still need other things, equipment, but we can't get it now because for obvious reasons, we need to, you know, put money up so we can get, we need another speaker now. We, there's a couple of things we need. You understand? Some of these things, they just show up. You don't know where they come from. But what I'm trying to show you is that when you look at our forefathers, that's why I say when you read the book of Acts, when the apostles got together, they got things done and they left that example for us. You understand? They got stuff done. Because they understood that we all we've got. Whatever little two cents and two rents we have, we bring it together. And guess what? We are able to push this movement forward. We believe in this thing. Those of you that believe, all oh, praise to the Lord. Those that do not, get your mind right. You understand? Get your mind correct. Stop being a bugs bunny. Watch this. Give me the book of Ezra, okay? Give me the book of Ezra. No, you know what? Read verse 27 again. We read verse 27. Something I want to bring out of this verse. Read it. John chapter 6, verse 27. Go ahead. Labor not for the meat which, which perishes, but for that meat which, which endureth unto lasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. Read. For him has God the Father. It says, for him has God the Father sealed. You see that part right there? It says, you are sealed. For him had God the Father sealed. The Lord has sealed that brother or that sister. You just don't know it. But those of you that you have to, you, you are stuck between, you are holding between two opinions. Should I give arms? Should I not? Should I? I understand the brothers and sisters that do not have it. I get that. And those of you that do not have it, we give, we give arms on your behalf. Why? Because we see that you believe in this truth. You understand? So I'm not talking about those brothers and sisters that generally don't have it and they can't. I get that. But those that have and you are holding back because you think, mm, you know, I have something that I want. But the needs of the nation, you are, facing with the, you are faced with the needs of the nation, but you're concerned about your want. God, the Lord, he says, don't labor for the meat which perishes. You are holding on to that thing because of the want, but you are neglecting the needs of the nation. You see that thing right there? Mm -hmm. Watch this. Give me the book of Ezra. Ezra 1. Let me show you our forefathers, you know, you understand? Our forefathers, even the king himself, he was not cheap. Watch this. I'm going to show you from top down. Ezra 1 and 1. Watch this. The book of Ezra, chapter 1, verse 1. You know what? You know what? Mm, this is Cyrus, right? Hold on. Cyrus is going to talk to the nation of Israel. We're going to read verse 1. We're going to jump down. Um, no, no. Read verse 2. Okay. Ezra 1, verse 2. Read that. Ezra, chapter 1, verse 2. Read. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, mm -hmm. and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Which is in Judah. It says what? It says he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. What are we doing right now? We are building the house of the Lord. We are building the walls of Jerusalem once again, spiritually. You understand? Go ahead. Who is there among you of all these people? 
mm. his God with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. So even Cyrus is acknowledging that our the God of Israel, he is the true living God. You understand? The God of Jacob. Go ahead. Watch this. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the man of his place help him with silver mm -hmm. and with gold and with goods and with beasts beside the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. You see what he's saying? He says, listen, whoso, and he says, listen, we need to build the house of the Lord. That's what we are doing right now. Spiritually, we are raising the 12 tribes of Israel. And the 12 tribes of Israel, they are scattered all over the place. They are not just in Midrand. They are not just in Kakehong. They are not just in Pretoria. Mm -mm. They are all over the world. Understand that. Hold this. Give me Matthew 28 verse 19. You see, because we, you, we don't put ourselves in this book. We don't sink our spirit in this Bible. That's the reason why we are so confused. Matthew 28 verse 19. Watch this. Matthew chapter 28 verse 19. Read. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, mm -hmm. baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So now he says, this is Christ speaking. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Because the children of Israel, we are scattered among all nations on earth. According to 24 verse 27 down. Next verse. Watch this. Go ahead. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever mm. I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. You see what Christ is saying? He says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So how are you going to teach these the, the, the Israelites scattered among all nations on earth? How are you going to teach them? What do you need? You need the Bible. You need Bibles. So that means we need to buy these Bibles. We need the Apocrypha. We need the KJV. We need the dictionaries. You understand? We need the teaching aids. We need flyers. We need business cards. You see, we need uniforms. The list goes on and on. We need to travel. We need to go to different places to teach this. You see that thing? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. Which you want? The laws of God. You're not going to sit there and speak your own. We need, we need speakers. We need a mic. We need batteries for the, speak, for, the, for the mics and so forth. We need cables. We need stands. We need tripods. We need cameras so we can put our videos out so our people can see what the Bible is saying and wake up. All of this is not manna from heaven. No, we need arms to do this stuff. We don't need arms to be able to do what? We don't know. We, we eat, we're living life. No, we're working. We've got jobs. We're not living off the congregation. We have our own. We work nine to five. So that well, the little bit that the Lord is blessing us with, we can show faith that we believe this. So we're going to use what we have that the Lord has blessed us with to push this truth forward. But it requires men that be able to see the vision that is being painted. You understand? Because we don't think about stuff. Read that thing again, verse 20. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Read. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Come on. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. You see what he's saying? He says, even to the end, to the end of the world. So is you, us just teaching in mid range into that's the end of the world? No. That means we have to cross borders. We have to go to Mozambique. We have to go to Zimbabwe. We have to go to Gabon. We have to go to Mauritius. We have to go to all these different Cape Verde islands. We have to go to the Gulf of Guinea. We have to go to China, India. How are we going to do that? You see, we don't really put ourselves in this book to really see the work that is required of us. You understand? We don't understand this thing. Because while some of us were still in La La Land, you're still sleeping, you think, no, no, you're just going to be a professional student, a Dutch Christian church boy. No. We're not going to rock like that in Soldiers of Christ. No, no, we've got work to do. You understand? We've got work to do. And we believe what is written in this book wholeheartedly. You don't believe in it, you can get off the train. The train will keep moving. You understand? 
So I need you men, especially, sink your spirit in this Bible. Sisters too. You understand? Go back to Ezra. Okay, Ezra chapter 1 verse 4. This is what the king of King Cyrus, king of Persia, this is what he's saying to Israel. Okay, read that. Because we, was, we, we need to go back to rebuild. The, the, we, need to, we need to go back to rebuild because Jerusalem was destroyed. Now we're building the second temple. You understand? After it was destroyed by the Babylonians and Esau. Now we are rebuilding the walls, you understand, of Jerusalem. You understand? And the temple itself, because it, they, they, they destroyed the temple. Now we are rebuilding. That's the same thing we are doing now. Rebuilding Jerusalem, spiritually. And we have to build our people up. Guess what? We go to different places. They don't have Bibles. You understand? They don't have the Apocrypha. You understand? They don't have fringes. They don't have a bottle of blue. They have none of these things. They don't have any of these things. That's why all the time, we are not going to be doing that now going forward when we go to camp. We must go there with fringes. So we can give these fringes to our people and so they can sew them on their shirts. That's the next thing that we're going to be doing going forward. Understand that. Ezra 1 verse 4. Read that. Of Ezra. Chapter 1, verse 4. Read. And whosoever remaineth any place where he sojourneth, let the man of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts beside the free will offering to the house of God that is in Jerusalem. You say it says besides, meaning outside of the free will offering that you give freely, it says, guess what? We need silver, we need gold, you understand? We need goods, we need beasts beside, meaning outside of the free, except outside of the free will offering. These are the things that are needed in order for us to rebuild. So Cyrus is making a decree for all Israelites in Persia to understand this. You understand? Because we was comfortable in Persia. Next verse, read. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and mm -hmm. the priests and the Levites with all them whose spirit God raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. The spirit of the Lord, guess what? Those men that have the spirit of the Lord on them is as, and with all them whose spirit God has raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. When you have that spirit of complaining, the spirit of the Lord is not upon you because you don't want to build. You just want to mama and complain and be that cheap Negro. Okay, come on. And all they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, and with beasts, and with precious things, beside all that was willingly offered. You see that willingly, willing is as besides all that was willingly offered, is as all they that were about them strengthened their hands. All, they, all those that were about the men that the spirit of the Lord was upon. They said, listen, we're going to help. You understand? He says, he says, they strengthened them with their hands with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, and with beasts, and with precious things, besides all that was willingly offered, meaning free will offerings. Go ahead. Also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem and mm -hmm. had put them in the house of his gods. Read. Even though with Cyrus, king of Persia, bring forth by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and numbered them unto Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. They, you see that? So they were handling this business, these men. Go ahead. And this is the number of them. 30 charges of gold, a thousand charges of silver, nine and twenty knights. Come on. 30 basins of gold, silver base of a second sort, 410, and other vessels, a thousand. Read. All the vessels of gold and of silver were 5,400. All these Shesh Bazaar bring up with them of the captivity that were brought up from Babylon unto Jerusalem. They were brought up from Babylon unto Jerusalem. So you see our forefathers, the way, how they were rolling? Verse, four and, verse 5 and 6 is telling you that 
They did not complain. They say, you know what? We got to do this thing. We need to build, we need to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. We need to rebuild Jerusalem because it's destroyed. That's the same condition we're in right now. We must rebuild our people do we, because we are Jerusalem. You understand? We are Jerusalem and we must rebuild. It's not going to happen like manna from heaven. No. You understand? It's not going to happen like that. But a lot of the times, guess what? We tend to just sit and just relax. We think, nah, you know, we, it's not really, it's, it's not that serious. No, listen, you're in the wrong place if you think that. Okay? You were in the wrong place. Watch this. Give me, um, give me Ezra chapter, give me Ezra chapter 3 verse 1. You know what? Mm -hmm. No, no. Start at verse Ezra chapter. Give me Ezra 2 verse 68. The book of Ezra chapter 2 verse 68. Read. And some of the chief fathers, when they came to the house of the Lord, which is at Jerusalem, offered freely for the house of God to set it up in his you see what they were saying? These were our forefathers that the spirit of the Lord has raised. They said, listen, when they came to the house of the Lord, which is at Jerusalem, because they saw it was desolate. They're like, wait a minute. Listen, this thing is bothering me. We need to fix this thing. They were bothered by the desolate Jeru Jerusalem that was desolate by the heathens. They were like, no, 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 no. We're not going to be dealing with dwelling in our sealed houses when the house of the Lord is lying waste. We're not going to sit there and just fold our arms and twiddle our fingers. They said, no, we're not doing that. He says, they came to the house of the Lord, which is at Jerusalem. So they looked at it and said, look at it. It's desolate. He says, they offered freely for the house, of, the house of God to set it up in his place. Because it wasn't set up, because it was destroyed by the heathens. And Nebuchadnezzar took all our precious things and carried them into Babylon. Cyrus had to go there and collect those things. Okay, come on. They gave after their ability unto the treasure of the work three score and one thousand drams of gold and five thousand pounds of silver and one hundred priests garment. You see what they, they were giving things. Why? Because they understood not only do we need bricks, we don't, not only do we need concrete and all of that, cement and all that, but we only also need what? We need clothes. We need garments and so forth and so forth. Guess what? Isn't that what we're doing now for the Feast of Tabernacles? Yes, we need garments. And those garments are not cheap. We need, we need arms to buy these garments. We need arms to buy the meat. We need arms to get the, the baking going. We need arms. We need arms for a whole lot of stuff. You understand? Next verse. Read. So the priests and the Levites and some of the people and the sinners and the porters and the Nephilims dwelt in their cities and all Israel in their cities. Because now, remember, they were building the nation. They were building, they were building the temple. They were build, they rebuilding it. You understand? Now everybody was able to be set in their places. The Levites in their places, the Levites in their cities and all of that. Why? Because the people that were what were about this work, they got it done. They were not complaining. They were not murmuring. You understand? They were not giving no lip. They understood what was required of them because we are at war and the nations don't want us to rise, to rise up. But some of you, you forget that because you are in love with your money. You don't understand the requirement that the Lord needs. We owe the most high. That's what you brothers don't get it. We owe the Lord. And the most high is, is giving us grace in the lens of our captivity. He's allowing us to build. You think the Lord is going to say, in the lens of your captivity, we must repent. Okay, we repent. That means we need a place to worship. We need clothes. We need Bibles. We need study materials. We need educational programs, which requires what? They require arms for us to do that because the children must learn. We must set up our own schools and all of that. Where does that, where the arms come from? The people that come in that believe this truth. So how are we going to do that? The most High God is not saying, okay, repent. Okay, then what? You need fringes. People are poor. So, but those of us that can help, we must assist willingly. No lip, no nothing. Just get it done. Okay. 
But a lot of us, we don't move in that spirit. We don't move in that spirit. I'm trying to show you that our forefathers, listen, they did not play games when it comes to because they understood the importance of raising a nation up. It's not a game. It's not a joke. You understand? Give me that in Matthew. Give me that in Luke. Okay, chapter 17, verse 20. Luke chapter 17, verse 20. Read. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, mm -hmm. he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Read. The kingdom of God does what? Neither shall. The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. It's not going to come while you are twiddling your thumbs. You understand? It's not going to do that. Is not going to happen. It says, does not come with observation. That means we have to move. You cannot sit there just be observing. That means you have to observe it. You are not part of the building process. You're just sitting there, just folding your arms, like watching paint dry. So Christ says, don't be an observer. Participate. Okay, come on. Neither shall they say, look here or look there for hope. The kingdom of God is within you. Is within you. How is it within you? God says, I listen, I've given you, give me that in Revelation 2, verse 26. How is it within you? Watch this. Revelation 2, verse 26. Start of verse 25. Revelation. Revelation chapter 2, verse 25. Read. But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. What we have already, the scriptures with us. And everything we need is in this book for us to build in the lens of our captivity. With the little two cents and two rents that we got, the Lord says, you got what I need. Get yourself together. Get your mind right. Move in the spirit. Have salt in yourself. You'll be able to build even with the two rents you've got, you'll still build. That's what he's saying right there. Understand that. Now watch this. Go back to Luke now, chapter 9. I mean Mark, Mark 9. Okay. Mark chapter 9, verse 50. The book of Mark, chapter 9, verse 50. Salt is good, but if the salt lost his saltness, wherewith will he season? Have salt yourselves. And have peace one with another. He says, have salt in yourselves. Why is he saying that? Because the salt is the word of God. You understand? The salt is the word of God which gives you flavor. Because you are a sacrifice. We are a living sacrifice. The laws of God is what's going to give us flavor. You understand? Because a sacrifice needs what? It needs so seasoning. You must season the sacrifice. What's going to season our minds and our spirits? The laws of God, so that you become that sweet smelling savor unto the most high, so that he doesn't do this. Because if you are double minded, here's what's going to happen when the Lord receives you as a burnt offering. Watch this. Now go back to Revelation 3, verse 15, so we can understand what Christ was saying. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. Go ahead. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Mm -hmm. I Read. would that word cold or hot. Go ahead. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of them out of my mouth. What did the Lord say? He says, I will what? I will spew thee out of my mouth. So Christ says, I'm gonna spew thee out of my mouth. Why? Because you're not seasoned. You ever eat meat that is not seasoned, doesn't have salt, nothing? It tastes like nothing. Yes, you spew, you, you spew it out of your mouth because it don't taste. It wasn't seasoned. So likewise, Christ says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Why? Because you are not seasoned. You don't have salt. So who's supposed to taste that? That doesn't have salt. You see what Christ, that's what the Lord is saying right here with this verse right here. He says, I'm going to spew you out of your mouth because you are not seasoned. You are a, you are, here you are, you say I'm a sacrifice, 
but this, you are a sacrifice that is not seasoned with salt. Who's supposed to eat that? Who's supposed to receive that type of sacrifice that is not seasoned with salt? Nobody going to eat that. You understand? Read that again, verse 16. Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. Mm -hmm. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I will spew thee out of my mouth. All praises to the most high God. I'm going to end the class right here. Okay, let's break bread in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ for laying his life down for us. Okay. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed to pray. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take it. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.